discussion, and we are going to talk a little bit about the construction accord. But I think it's fair to say that you uh, know a lot more about the construction accord than I do. So would you like to start the session, Peter, and tell us a little about the construction accord? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you for hanging on and waiting for your lunches for long enough to, to, to listen to this last session. I, I could do anywhere between two minutes and a week on this thing that we call the construction accord, so I'll what, try and stick to the two-minute version. The week or the two-minute version? We'll, we'll, I think we'll, we'll go with the two-minute. <laughs> we'll go two minutes. And this is built out of some work that we've done collaboratively between um, the whole of the public sector, focused around the Scottish Government and the construction industry, that started with a recovery plan during COVID and getting the industry working again and recovering. And, and we're now at a very different stage, I would say. We, we all know what's happened since the heart of COVID. You know, we've been through quite quick and um, start up again through very great pressures on materials, on inflation. And we're now at a stage, as we've heard so much about today, where the whole industry is sort of hungry for the next transformation stage. But what, what do we do to build the industry we need for the future rather than fix up the industry we had in the past? And the Accord is very much about moving the collaborative work of the whole industry, by which I mean the big corporates, as, as many small companies as we can get involved, critically the trade and professional bodies where that capacity to, 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 to communicate and to create change exists, and to get them working with the public sector, who are not only policy makers, but also provide the client base for about half of the output of that industry how we can create the collaborations between those, between those stakeholders to get that transformation we want. And we've set a bunch of outcomes that we believe are right for the industry. So we set outcomes for business and the economy. We want successful, whisper, profitable businesses that sustain um, people and, and create, uh, be a, a part of the economy. We want improved outcomes for the workforce. So we want fair work, we want to have a more diverse range of people entering this fantastic industry and finding their career here. We want improved outcomes for customers and users of the, the assets that we create. And we want improved outcomes for the environment and for the communities in which this industry is active, which is every community <laughs> across Scotland. So trying to tether a bunch of transformative actions to those outcomes and be always guided by a set of outcomes and have a structure of collaboration that can last a long time because some of these changes will take time to deliver. So a bunch of outcomes we all agree on and a, some collaborative arrangements that stretch across the industry and the public sector. And we've started to build now the, the early work streams of activity that we want people to get involved in. So my ask, if you'd like to finish this little bit, is to say, if you're keen to get involved, have a look at the website of the Construction Leadership Forum, which glues all of this work together. Find out about our early work stream activities. You'll see a one-liner in there as to what it is, and, and sign up if you're keen to get involved in that activity, or indeed just to hear about our ongoing work, you can sign up as a network member. But what we're really keen on is people who want to put their energy and their time into working in these collaborative groups to, to, to push the change out through the industry. I'll say we're about 400 people in this room, Mm -hmm. the, the work yep. that BEST has done to help us um, map the database of the, of the industry, what is our data set. The, the employment in the construction industry is about 160,000, 6% of the economy. But if we look to the construction and related industries, as I would call it, I think your data set that you put together, Stephen, shows that that's about 320,000. So we're about, by my rudimentary maths, 0.01% of the industry in this room today. <laughs> So it's about spreading all the things that we know and that we are desperate to do out across that industry through those, through those collaborative groups to improve the outcomes that we've talked about. Well, I think this is exactly right. We talk about this um, a lot in BEST as well, about how we know we're in this space where we have got the right tools at our disposal, but have we got them into enough hands to get this acceleration really pushing forward? So I think that's probably... Yeah. Um, Put simply, no, we, we don't, absolutely don't. Uh, and I think that's you know, part of bringing everybody together today and part of having the opportunity to talk about the construction accord, which you know, at a strategic level, 
is that relationship that we need to build, fundamentally need to build between industry and between government and all the component parts that are a massive client of our built environment community um, to make sure that you know, when we're talking about innovation, you can join that golden thread up or you can join the dots, connect up that golden thread. It takes you from, you know, you've just heard from a number of companies that are in, um, creating brilliant products, but how do we get them embedded within the breadth of industry that could be amazing clients for those things? And taking all the way back to Chrissy's points uh, he touched on earlier, um, the opportunity to reshore a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the materials, the products that we're going to need in the future to get us to where we need to get to. If we don't have mechanisms like the construction accord, if we don't have relationships and partnerships between industry and between government and those, client, you know, th those clients that procure from our industry, then we're not going to be able to achieve most of those outcomes. So, um, so this is an opportunity, I think, um, not, not the first opportunity we've had, and I, and I did uh, Peter you was laughing earlier. I, I made a list up, right? You'll all have a laugh at this, right? I made a list of all of the times that our industry or related government organisations have said this is what the construction industry needs to do. I'm not going back pre war, pre Second World War. So, 1944, the Simon Report, 1967, the Banwell Report, big gap in the 70s, 80s, nothing I could find. Latham in 1994, Egan in 1998, Wilson Home in 2009. Mark Farmer's Modernise and Die 2016, Construction 2025, which was written in 2016, Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, Transforming Construction in 2018, and in 2013 and 2019, Construction Scotland, Industrial Leadership Group developed its strategies. And now we have the Construction Accord. Yeah. In all of those periods, there have been challenges, but I don't think there's ever been the sort of challenges and indeed the opportunities that we face then that we have on our doorstep now. And that, for me, makes me hugely optimistic that the construction accord, with the enthusiasm, the passion, the creativity of all the stakeholders that are involved, and the willingness to collaborate around it, um, gives us the best opportunity of, of what I've been talking about earlier, this transition from you know, writing down what good looks like but not being able to turn it into action, to really moving forward on the action point of it. So I think we have that kind of spirit in the construction yeah. accord. We do. And you won't find anything in there that purports to be an answer because we don't know what the answers are. We want to get the collaborative groups together to work on what elements of those answers might be to lead towards a bunch of things that I think if you read them, you will agree are outcomes that we can all sign up to. So this is not an instruction manual, do this and things will be fixed. It is work together in this way and we stand the best chance that we understand of getting it fixed between us. No, quite right, but if we take, for example, you know, the list that you've just set out, and we, if we assume that partly they came to a conclusion because they did have outcomes that were met, or partly because maybe they were falling short of maybe the aspiration that they needed to have, and so something else came in in its place, um, in order to ensure that maybe it doesn't become a revolving door of, of situations like this, we, don't we really need to be talking about, yes, outcomes, but also getting all of this into sort of natural practice and practice in all of our industries so that actually what we're doing is part of that cultural transformation and change so that, you know, we're getting to a place where this just becomes second nature, where actually ultimately we don't need, dare I say it, we don't need, you know, innovation like this anymore because it's actually what we're doing. So my question maybe might be to you that if this one is going to be really aspirational and that much more broad reaching because it is such a huge context to find ourselves within, what role and what place do we have to engage beyond the built environment in terms of all of addressing those co-benefits that we've spoken about earlier on? You know, where does the health sector sit in all of this? Where do the education sector, all of those things, you know, is there an opportunity to even, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to make more work for you here now, <laughs> Peter, but, you know, could we throw that door even wider and would there be some way of engaging on that level to give this even a broader remit and therefore maybe more energy? Well, we are doing, uh, uh, and I, I don't want to paint a picture of perfection. I don't think it exists uh, and, and we all know it's the enemy of the good anyway. So, so I, I think we're doing what we can to engage more broadly and um, so, so health, for example, we know that Scotland's Chief Medical Officer has, has made climate change one of the biggest public health challenges. So we know that the health sector is engaged in not just decarbonising its estate, but thinking about how its activities in general can help lead towards decarbonisation and therefore enhance public health. And I mentioned 
the government as policymakers. So the bits that I work with in government are trying to join up all of those things all the time. It's an awful big thing to get your arms around the whole time, but that's what we're trying to do. I sort of slight aside, but I was uh, judging in the Scottish Civil Engineering Awards um, this month, and for the first time, I saw an entry into those awards that had a research-based um, evidence of health improvements that came from a single project in the built environment in an area in Glasgow. So we are beginning to make those connections. We need to do it a lot more. Everyone in this room knows that we need to do that. But making those connections and building those collaborations, I think, is the best chance we've got of doing it. I'll add one thing, and it's a statistic that I'm probably going to get wrong. Um, so apologies in advance, but there was a, a report I read or an article I read fairly recently that said for every pound you invest in sustainable built environment solutions, you save something like 46 pence in, um, in health care you know, services that you need to provide in different ways to treat some of the issues that come out of the poor building practices that have happened in the past. So you know, if you don't build buildings properly, you end up with damp, you end up with mould, people end up with asthma, you then have to treat those problems. So looking at the prevention side of it rather than the cure side of it is where I think the built environment, as I touched on earlier, we underpin every other sector, every other part of the economy. So yeah, whether it's health, yeah, whether it's transport, whether it's energy more widely, we have a really important role to play in that. And as Peter says, I think the connections across all of that, we always talk about you know, our built environment ecosystem, but all those adjacent ecosystems that we engage with um, have got to be part of that conversation. Yeah. I'm very conscious of time, but I was delighted to follow Jennifer in this, and, and because in the end we are built environment, but we're built environment people. Mm -hmm. and, and so the things that I would like everyone, if you can, to take away from about the Accord, and just a few things is, today we've talked a lot about the confidence in our industry. So we, we sometimes get a downer on ourselves, but we are part of the solution, not part of the problem. So being confident in ourselves, and we're trying to build that up through these collaborations. So confidence, carbon, all through today and uh, um, but but for me competencies so how do we help spread out what people need to do differently and be competent in to deliver this change they need to be digitally competent and um, we've heard that today they need to be competent in the technologies that we need we need to be competent in the business processes so we need to be competent in delivering quality so that element of of, of spreading out and engaging in and and training the next generation of people through their careers and not just at a one-off for a few years and then let them out into the world so carbon competencies and then collaboration so having confidence in ourselves as an industry thinking about carbon every time thinking about competencies not just train and forget and the collaborations that will deliver that i think if we can do that in these new ways of working and um, through the accord then then we've got a good chance of having a go at some of the massive challenges in front of us that would be how we take those conversations even into the home. So, you know, we talk a lot about the industry and we talk to each other as an industry somewhat, we're getting better at that. Um, but also I think if we're gonna embed some of these sort of thoughts and concepts and, and as we heard about the need to reach everybody, actually, you know, trusting that you can have some of these conversations at, at home, you never know what that might spark and what other, you know, person might say, well, actually, and we're doing this thing and, and I'm in this sector, I never knew we shared this common ground. So it'd be really good as well to take those conversations with us, not just in our daily professional lives, but take that home. And you know, don't take your work home all the time. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that, we also need a break. But it is expanding the reach of the conversations that you're having, which I think is a really key part of it. I think everybody's probably ready for lunch, should we say. <laughs> Um, thank you, uh, Peter, so, and again, the extended, uh, the invitation extends to you as well uh, to come on the podcast and hear a little more. Um, and, you know, do find all of our speakers and do, like, make contact and, and have conversations uh, this afternoon. Um, we will do a little wrap-up, uh, I think. Yeah, we'll do a quick sum-up.